On episode number 50, we are joined by Big Brother Canada winner, Tyshawn Carter Newman. Tune into episode number 50. Yes, we just said it, 50, as we are joined by a former college athlete, a Big Brother Canada winner, amazing race, competitor, an entrepreneur, and a man of many more traits. Tune in on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcast from. Welcome to another edition of Talk Your Exposure, and today's a special one, not just because of our guests, but because of the fact that we're on episode number 50. Halfway to 100 is always a milestone. We're about to get there. We're about to make it. We're about to get to where we, where we wanted to get to from the beginning of time. But before we introduce our guests, I got to introduce the ugly co-host of mine. His name is Chris Campbell. What's up, man? I don't know why you look in the mirror and using my name. <laughs> <laughs> You thought, you thought about that one. You thought to that. You know what? Steven's probably going to get at me today, so I got to make sure that, he, that I have a comeback for him. Didn't you think that? You woke I'm up this morning thinking about all the different scenarios in your mind, didn't you? I told you. You're, you're warming me up. It's going to be problems with you, Stephen. Don't get me started with you. I keep on telling you. I keep on giving you warnings. But you know, it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. The guests will start seeing. People will understand. They'll be like, yo, I'm not going to start picking on Chris. I'm not going to pick on this guy. This guy's underground self. He's a company. A company. So it's all good. But yes, we're back at it. Season five zero. How you feeling, man? Hey man, I'm good, man. I'm good. I can't complain, brother. You know, just, just trying to trying to get things going, trying to get things back up in normal, normal running again. Ready for no more lockdowns. I'm tired of hearing the word lockdown. I'm ready to get back to life. I'm ready to get back to normal. I'm ready for full capacity. I'm ready for no masks. I'm ready for no vaccine mandates. I'm ready for life. I'm ready. I, I agree. I'm I'm with listen, I'm ready. I think. Spring's the best time. We're going to spring back into action. All that stuff's going to disappear. Summer's going to roll out. I think it'll be a great summer. But you know what? It all starts with today. And let's get this rolling because I'm, I'm actually feeling happy. Yesterday was great weather that we had. First time I forgot to try to actually get warm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, like, so I'm, like, I'm excited. I'm excited. I get to meet up with you today. We're doing this again. Got a special guest. I love you. have been talking about this guy. Hey, yo, come on, Steven. Let's do this, man. And our special guest for today, his name is Tyshawn Carter Newman, entrepreneur, winner, big brother, collegiate basketball player, man of many, many, many traits. Someone I've known for about 16 years, 16, 17 years already. We've went at each other for, you know, how long we've, we've, we've gone against each other at basketball. But it's great to have him on the show, Tyshawn. Welcome to the show, man. Yo, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate the invite. It's crazy. <laughs> You're, you're still Hollywood, bro. I told you before the show, you're a Hollywood guy. You know, I've known each other for so long, but here you are now. And, and, and man, it, it, took, it took my girlfriend to be able to get you. I'm like, bro, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody. It's crazy. No, no, no. Listen, listen. Instagram's not for business. Instagram's for social. <laughs> we, we doing business? Send an email. I always tell everybody, you want to do business? We got to go on emails. That's the official way. What's the email that people can, that people can hit you up on if you do if they do want to you know partner with you for for, for business? Where where can they find you on a, on an email? You can find me to Sean X Carter at gmail.com. and then you can find me on YouTube to Sean's World or to Sean Carter Newman. Like that's my YouTube's where you can find me. That's where I tell my story. That's where I share my life. Like that's I'm just showing my journey, and it's like that's that's where you can find me at 100. percent Say no more. Say no more. Hey, Tashawn, we're, we're going to get the, the, the show started with a little game. You know, get your mind flowing a little bit. See where you're at. You know, we got we got a game called Would You Rather? And today is going to be a little bit interesting because, like I mentioned earlier, you're a man of many traits. So we decided to give a diff different, you know, feel for the Would You Rather with different type of questions, different scenarios, just for you. So first one I'm going to ask you is, would you rather be a millionaire but an employee or have or be a thousandaire as a CEO? Millionaire employee. Why is, that, why is that? I'm curious to know because I, because I, because the, the type shot I know would rather be a C CEO and take over the world. Uh, so me, I'm not really a status guy. I don't need to be the man in order to feel appreciated in this world. I'm not really a big ego person. So to be a millionaire, I mean, I would have freedom to invest and freedom to do a lot of different things without having the title or the responsibility associated with it. So I'll take the millionaire. Fair enough. Hmm. Fair enough. Now, a little bit of basketball for you. Would you rather be able to shoot like Kyle Korver or dribble like Kyrie Irving? Shoot like Kyle Korver. You were a jump, shooter. You definitely were shot. a shooter. Jump shot. Get, <laughs> there's a commercial I remember. Was it AI in the commercial where he's like, he talks about like what a jump shot could get you? Yep. A jump shot can get you a lot of things. What a handle gets you uh, 
two year contract and no one signs you. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Now we know we know you like to you like you, you got a little sweet tooth, you know. So I got a question for you. Would you rather eat fruit but taste like but but taste like your favorite candy or drink water but it tastes like your favorite soda? Eat fruit, tastes like my favorite candy. Okay. Now, would you rather relive a moment as a teenager during your basketball career or relive a teenage moment while living at home? Wow, what? Repeat that one for me. Would you rather relive a moment as a teenager during a basketball career or like, like one of your basketball games, high school games, or would you rather relive a teenage moment while you're living at home? No, nah, it'd, it'd be a teenage moment as a basketball game. Come on, like that. Those <laughs> days were crazy. Like, it has to be that. It's crazy. It's crazy how basketball is changing now, man, especially in Canada as well. Like just, the, you know, OBA is no longer really relevant. I remember back in the day when, when we were playing, OBA was everything. We, we, lo we love talk, talking about OBAs, you know, shit like that. So to be able to see how the, I guess, the basketball evolution has changed now, prep schools are all over the place. You were actually one, of, one person that, you know, started off that, that you know, prep school stuff as well. Do you, you mind, you mind giving, I think you went to, uh, uh, you went to prep school your fifth year, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? No, I actually stayed here the whole time. I didn't go to prep school at all. Um, it, my Like my boys did. Um, they all went down to Roe Russell's uh, prep school in, in North Carolina. But no, I wasn't part of the prep school thing at all. Like I, I stayed home and I just went to university. I thought there was a prep school in, in uh, Hamilton that, that people went to. I was affiliated with Bounce or something. Wasn't there a prep school in, in, in Bounce that they, they, did, they did? There was one called Rita. I remember yes. that. Yeah, yeah, awesome. uh, Terry. yeah, Terry Upshaw. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't I didn't go to that one at all. We played, I remember we played against them as a rep team um in my last year, but no, I, I didn't play with them. And I remember like I went to university kind of early and mm. I was still the age to play rep ball. And I remember at the time there was a rule that you couldn't play if you played university, you couldn't play rep no more. And I remember that that broke my heart because they just put that rule in. Yep. And I'm like, what's the difference? I'm still rep age. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't play with Amanda at the coach. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, born and raised in Peel Region, or at least in, in that west side of it. Uh, you know, I know you were all over the place in terms of the the, the west side. But born and born and raised in the west side, west coast. Talk to us about your upbringing. So I was actually born. What you might not know, I was born in Montreal. I actually okay. grew up mostly in the city in Toronto, and then I mostly I moved to the west probably in grade nine, grade ten. Okay, and. My upbringing was very different depending on like where I was. So like when I grew up in the city, it was very like independent. Like I could go around, bike around, do what I want on the subway, on the bus. Uh, very different lifestyle than when I got to the West. Like you get to the, when I got to Branton, it was like basketball was different. Um, the school was different. The environment was different. Like now you're in the suburbs, but you were with ballers, ballers out there. And the quality of ball actually was better in the suburbs than it was in the city which I remember that was really surprising to me. And it was like, once I got out to like Saga Brampton, it's like, that's when almost like ball became a little bit more serious in a weird way, because it was just like, that's all we had to do. We could, we weren't, I wasn't on the streets no more. I, like <laughs> when you're in the summer, you're in your crib or you're in the gym where you're like, mm -hmm. you're not on, you're not on road. Cause there's nowhere to go. Like we're going to go to Horton's parking lot. So it was like, <laughs> <laughs> Like my life was literally just, it was ball, it was school, and it was just like, we're all just trying to make it. And I remember, like, that was my focus. I know that, you know, a little bit about you as well. You've always been someone who wanted to give back to the youth and, and your community. Obviously, you have you, you started a, a company called Aspire for Hire with the youth basketball. Uh, what made you want to, you know, what made you want to give back to the community and want to be an influential person to the kids and youth around you? So actually, Aspire for Hire is actually one of my best friends, her organization, and I work a lot with her on different initiatives and different programs. But why I want to give back and it's why it's so important for me, because I, I just feel like we took so much. <laughs> it's really like as a, as a youth, like I took so much, like I asked for so much, I wanted so much. And it's like I realized the impact um, that people had on me who were you know, older and who have gone through it. And when they were able to give back and tell me about their experiences and share, it was, it was impactful. And it was, it, it, it was something that I needed as a youth. And I think like now that I'm in a position where I can give back and tell my story and really have an impact on the youth, it, that's, that's what I do. I just think in our lives, we have, we, we look for purpose. And I feel like giving um, 
feel so much better um, mm. than just take it. You know what I yeah. mean? And for me, it's like I like to give and I like to have an impact on the youth, especially someone that looks like God and someone who they can relate to. I think it's just so powerful beyond measure. We're going to get back to your basketball, the, the, your basketball career and what you've done with this fire hire in a little bit. But lastly, I want to ask you that we're, we're on to, you know, the ugly guy up above. But um, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, we, you, you love to poke, eh? <laughs> Hey man, I'm poking the bear. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for you to explode, man. I'm waiting for it to explode. But uh, last question I want to. <laughs> last question I want to ask you is if you could if you could make your own initiative related to basketball and also do do some type of fundraising as well. What was something that you'd want to do? I think like if I was to do something going forward, I think I would have. There's a couple of things I've even been thinking about in my mind. Like I've thought about you know having like a large scale group home type of environment. I thought about having like a mentorship, like a foundation where like we do mentorship with the youth, where we connect youth with people who they can relate to and who they can look up to. Um, I, 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 Cause I think like during the teenage years, you can have such a strong impact on youth. And I feel like I would want to have such a strong hand in that. So whether it was like a kind of group home initiative or a mentorship initiative and, and connecting basketball with all those things or sports in general, mm -hmm. I think is something that, you know, I, I would, I would definitely see myself being involved with. And it's not even off the table in the future. Like, these are things I think about. There's a lot of ways I think about giving back. And that is that is one of them, like giving to the youth in, in ways in which they need it the most. Tough. That's a, that's a good answer, man. I like that. I like that. You know, it's, I, you know it's, uh, it's funny you said that before I get into my questions. I have a good friend of mine who's out in Edmonton that you, that, that you might know. He used to coach at uh, Next, Gen, Next Gen Basketball with Coach hey. Dane. Yeah, of man. Course. Yeah, 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 man. I, 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 we grew up together and we grew up together in Rexdale. So I told him I was going to have you out. Yeah, man, we, we, that's how far back we go. <laughs> that's we crazy. Go like, I know, it's crazy. So I asked him about you and, you know, I said, ask him, you know, tell me a few things about you. And he's like, yo, honestly, he's a great guy. He's good with the kids, with the program, good basketball guy. He missed having you around. So you're just talking about the mention of basketball and combining together. It shows testament that, you know, that you're really about that. And he's and so... Shout out to Next Gen Basketball, and he said he had to shout you out right there. So, <laughs> yo, Dane's my guy, man. He's he's probably like he's the first guy in Edmonton that gave me a coaching opportunity. He really treated me like family too, because I went out there by myself, right? So it's like to have Dane and his family like bring me in as one of theirs. I think was was big for me. I always called him like he felt like my my uncle Phil. Like that's <laughs> that's what Dane felt like when I was out there. Like him on Viv, you know, his son was Carlton. Like I was just like they treated me like. <laughs> No, nah, they treated me like family. And it's like those are those years I cherish so much because I grew so much from from leaving Toronto and going somewhere where I didn't know anybody. And it, I really grew uh, a lot from that experience. Okay, well, good. Make sure you hit him up. So it's, that's the yeah, shout-out sure. All right, well, let's get into this. Big Brother. Wow. Last year this time, you were in Big Brother House fighting for 100000 What was casting for that show like for you? Uh, the casting process, like, I can't go into too much detail about it, but what I'll say is that, you know, after learning that it was a potential opportunity for me, uh, mm -hmm. seeing how the game works and kind of doing – I watched that game like it was game tape when I found out about, you know, potentially being on it. And it was like, this is a social game. I can win this. Okay. Like, I think about the people I grew up with, the shady characters I knew growing up, I'm like, these guys, this show will be light work compared to what I've seen in my life. Like, are you crazy? The amount of finessers and liars. And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. These people aren't finessing. These are just regular Canadians. These are not the these are not the people I grew up with. Like, I can handle this. All and right. That's how it was. So how was, like, being in the house then? I mean, being in the house was very stressful. Like, at the same time, as much as I was like, I can handle it and I can win, um, when I got there, I, I didn't feel that same way right away. Uh, you're just around a bunch of people who, you know, you may, may or may not be your friends for real, may or may not be tell, telling you the truth at any time. Like people could be lying to you, people could be stabbing your back, and you really have no idea what's really going on. You just got to trust your gut. And I think one thing I'll say from that experience is I learned to trust myself more than anything. Like, it's just like, you just got to go with what you feel inside. And a lot of times in your life, your gut is right. So that's all you, that's all I had. I didn't have a friend to call. 
I didn't have mom. I was like, mom, I don't know. I couldn't do that. Like, it was just like, I had to just figure it out. Who's lying, who's telling the truth, who's giving me good vibes, who's giving me bad vibes. What do I do in this situation? And, and just go with it. And so, that's a lesson in itself. I like that. And you said that when you said that, you know, you grew up with a lot of finessers and you had to figure yourself and game tape helped you as well. As much as it was crazy taking something from basketball to this, you know, you're there right now. When did you really envision yourself actually winning this whole thing? Like, when did you actually you know? First, I know a part of you like, yeah, I could probably win this. I could probably. But when did you get to the point where like, yo, I'm actually, I actually think I got this. <laughs> I think when I avoided, there was a situation in which like I felt like I should have, like somebody should have tried to take me out, and they didn't. <laughs> and I remember looking at it, being like, you guys really don't, you guys really are not seeing me. Like, you guys really don't want me out the game. <laughs> I was like, oh, I could win. And then when I took my boy Jed out the game, I was like, I'm going to win. Like, in, in my opinion, Jed was my biggest obstacle. Well, Jed mm -hmm. and Keeper, they were my biggest obstacles of winning the game. And once Jed was gone, I was like, if I don't win this, I'm joking. Like, <laughs> wow. He's, he's the only one really in my way. And then, um, and then once, I, once we got Kiefer out too, everything just fell into, kept falling into place so perfectly for me. And I'm just like, yo, it's looking like, the universe wants me to win this game. Like, it's just, it's not only my actions. Like, my actions were big, but it's like, things just kept happening. And I'm like, damn, like, I'm about to win this. <laughs> yeah. well, yo, well, you mentioned a few things. I'm going to get in a little more detail later on. But, you know, while you're there, you know, um, you create a, there's an alliance called the Sunsetters. Mm -hmm. Sunsetters, right? Uh, am I right? Sunsetters, right? Yeah. All right, so. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the Sunset is considered consider, it consists of yourself, Jed, Beth, Latoya, Kiefer, and uh, Tina. Am I right? Yeah. All right. So how did you guys get together? Like, how did the alliance come together with all five of you guys? I think it came together. I think Kiefer was really instrumental in bringing that together. Um, I think I always had envisioned being in this kind of alliance. And then when it was actually presented uh, to me by Kiefer, I was like, this is genius. Because I always said I wanted to be, before going on the show, it's like, if I had to be an alliance, it would be a diverse alliance. One of the most diverse you ever see. Where there's somebody from every area of the house in the alliance, right? Every social group. And that's what we had. And that alliance was, was a strong one. And it was, it was one in which we were, like, we took over the house for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because it was such a strong alliance. Like, <laughs> you want, we, like we weren't stressed. Till near the end of the game, because of how strong that alliance was. Mm -hmm. Almost like a basketball team. You got all the perfect pieces on the team. Like, it, exactly. Great. Like, you got to have everybody that knows their role and who can do different things. And I think that was the perfect part of the alliance. Everybody knew where they stood. Everybody knew what their role was. And it worked out perfectly. All right. Now I'm going to go back to Jed. So once, okay, you had to do something that looked very hard to do. You had to vote Jed out. After you you voted him out and you saw that there's a chance to come back to win this game. What were you thinking at that moment? Like, First of all, I, I just, I just got to say that whole scene was, was, was tripped me up, tripped me up. I'm watching. I'm like, Holy shit. They're about, he's about to come back in this game. And if <laughs> I watched that scene over it, I'm like, fuck, he really might come back in right now. And I knew, I knew if he did, like you mentioned earlier, that would have been fucked for you guys. 100 percent i'm like this is fucked up because in my head i'm like we did so much work to get this guy out like so much mm -hmm. and then just pop back in the house would have cheesed the hell out of me furthermore <laughs> he would have came he would have came for me he would have held me responsible for what happened to him and i think that was my biggest stress that was the first time where i would have a target on my back and i just didn't want to be in that kind of situation because throughout that game i never had a target on my back and if Jed had come back, he would have put a target on me because he'd have been like, yo, bro, you really did me like that? You really got me out and convinced everybody to vote me out? Like, nah, bro, it's, it's your fault. And I didn't want to be in that situation. So I was, my, there was knots in my stomach. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a fight. And I went to get him back out again. I'm like, imagine having to get someone out again. Like, that's what I was thinking, too. Like, I gotta do, we got to do this whole dance over again? I'm like, nah, man. And that was really what it was for me, right? I was stressed about having to do it all over again and being blamed for the whole thing. Yeah. With a target on your back. With a target on my back. 
And everybody would have blamed me too. Everybody would have been like, nah, it was him. And then I would have been yep. targeted and it would have been ugly. Okay. Uh, yo, so final cup, the final three comes, and it's you, Tara, and Braden. You wanted the final, and this, you wanted the final to be monumental to guarantee that a black person was the first ever to win Big Brother Canada, right? Um, and you eliminated Tara. When you won, <laughs> when you won and you made history, how did it change your life? I mean, at that moment, I don't think I realized how it changed my life. I don't think I had an appreciation for how impactful it was um, for Canadians, for television, for reality TV. I don't, I don't think I really grasped that at the moment, um, but it was huge, right? It was huge for me, myself, and like my personal development as I like even as until today. And at the time, I didn't realize that. But I think it was it was monumental for a lot of people after understanding like the impact it had and the people who've reached out and people who've just told me their stories about what they saw and, and how it made them feel. Mm -hmm. I think was it was crazy. And it, it made me realize like the impact one can have on society. And it's like it really has changed my mentality and even the work that I do. Like I've just completely shifted my life from working my nine to five job, from working to myself in order to just as aspiring to inspire like the work I do is really about inspiring people and helping grow people and grow myself. And that's how my journey has completely changed. Like my life has changed from that. Now I live a life like to serve and it's just, I never thought I would get there. I, I thought maybe I would, I didn't know how. And it seemed like that experience was the vehicle in which took me there. Sure. I like that's good. That's good. You know, everyone goes through something to get to that, to get to that point. You know, before I ask a question, I'm going to say something. So, you know, you went through this, and I'm, I would like to compare it back to basketball. So your basketball experiences and everything, is that how you kind of approach the whole game in the house as well? Like taking things from, like, you know, how to, you know, how to chess move and, you know, you know I'm going to watch this person. I'm going to, I'm going to scout this person. Like, is that how you kind of work yourself through the house? <laughs> I mean, now that you put it like that, you can say that. I, I mean, in the time, I wasn't thinking of it that way. I mean, I, I was, when I was watching film before the show, I was watching, like, game tape. Like, what are some qualities that make a really good big brother player, right? Mm -hmm. So those were things that I had to assess myself. So I, I was kind of watching that, like, game tape. And scouting people is, is, is a part of that, too. But the biggest one, the biggest lesson I would say from basketball that you could apply to this game is letting the game come to you. Mm, and like that in, in basketball a lot of times we're trying to force a shot force this for nah let the game come to you the defense will let you know what how what move you should make the defense will let you know what you should be doing let the game come to you like make read and react right and that's that's really how i play big brother you can't go in there and be like this is what i'm doing it's about reading and reacting Mm -hmm. And like my lessons for that were, and I had three, I always say there were three things that I knew were really important for me in that game. And it was listening more than you speak. Mm -hmm. You listen, you learn, so then you can read and react. Mm -hmm. nice. Second one was change as the game changes. The game is going to change. You're going to lose friends. Things are going, the dynamic of the house is going to change. You have to change with it. If you stay the same person the whole time and act the same and say the same things, it's not going to work for you. So mm -hmm. change the game changes. And lastly, treat everybody the same no matter mm -hmm. what the situation. And what I mean by that is when someone can do something for you, don't all of a sudden be their best friend. Mm -hmm. And if someone can't do something for you, don't just, you know, distance yourself from them because you come off as, as fake and authentic. I think for me, like, those lessons could be applied to life. They could be applied to basketball. They could be applied to, they could be applied to anything. And those are the lessons that weren't just basketball lessons. They were, they were life lessons. And basketball lessons are life lessons. Let's be real. <laughs> but those are the things I applied in the game, and I think they were an ultimate part of my success. I like that, man. Well, I'm going to wrap it up before that big bearded guy comes back in with his question. Um, after you win, what was the first thing you did after you won Big Brother? First thing. Went and saw my mom. <laughs> that's like the common answer for everybody <laughs> you know that was the first thing i did and you know we just we talked about it and she like she was crying like she was just like i'm so proud of you like it wasn't about just winning for you like it was just it was so much bigger and Good. it was it was a really special moment shout out mama dukes man shout out mama dukes always always, always got to give a big shout out to mama dukes 
Uh, one last question I do want to ask you before we get onto your basketball career, but I want to ask you though, when when the when the finale came and the, and the last, you know, you guys had to uh, um, ask for everyone's votes and everything, and both you and Brandon got up there and you 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 made your last last final speech. Was there any moment that you were looking around like, damn, I've I've screwed a couple people in here right now. I don't think I'm gonna get, gonna get these votes. Or did you know you're gonna get their votes regardless? See, the thing is, I didn't know I'd get their votes, and I knew, like, deep down, they didn't really want to vote for me. That was the thing. Like, I always knew, like, these people don't want to vote for me. However, I also knew that game-wise, if they're thinking game, there is no way they can vote for me. Like, there's no way Braden can win this game because it's like, in my honest opinion, I'm like, he didn't do anything. Like, he was just, he was nice. He was a great person, and he treated everybody with love and respect. But like, he didn't make any game moves. He didn't have to cut off his friends. He didn't have to – he didn't not touch the block. He didn't – he wasn't there strategizing. And, like, he, he didn't – he wasn't doing the things that I believed I was doing in order to win the game. It's like I felt like I wanted it so bad, and it was so clear how bad I wanted it. I didn't, I didn't feel that same energy from him. So I'm like, if they vote for him, they're only voting for him because they're salty with me. And I'm like, they can't be that salty – because I didn't really do anybody that dirty besides Jet, mm -hmm. to be honest. Man. I really didn't Fair do enough. nothing you guys besides Jet. Like, you guys just happened. You guys were just collateral damage. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out, Victoria. <clears throat> <laughs> I never did her anything. I actually tried to save Victoria. And I always tell her this. I'm like, I tried to save you. It didn't yep. work out. And as yep. a result, you got out. But that wasn't my fault. That wasn't like, your fault. That's why I said Shout out, Victoria, you know, but... Um, you know, uh, enough of Big Brother for a second. I want to move on to your basketball career. Like you mentioned earlier, you love basketball. Um, just curious to know, how did you get into basketball? How did I get into ball? My dad said, you're big. He brought me to a Mississauga <laughs> Monarchs tryout uh, back in when I was in grade three, four. And I didn't make the Monarchs, but I ended up making the Marauders at the time. Mm -hmm. And he just post. And that's how it started. Like, that's, that's literally it. My dad wants to put me into hockey, actually. But he said wow. I just didn't like the cold. It was too cold out there. So it just, <laughs> I, and I still don't like the cold. So it's not, it's not that surprising. And you went to Edmonton. <laughs> yeah, you know that's actually crazy. But that was more of like a work opportunity type of thing, you know. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if, if if you remember this organization, but Chris is actually the owner of uh, Motion Basketball. I don't Chris know if you remember Motion. Motion, Chris. I remember. Garth. <laughs> oh my God, you're going back to him. <laughs> Yo, I remember. Like, I remember Garth. I remember Kelvin. Like, I remember that. Yep. Like, oh, where is Kelvin? Is he still no, I, actually saw, I saw Kelvin yesterday. We were talking at the gym. He's out here. He's still repping. He's out okay, here. Okay, 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 okay. Of course I remember you guys. Like, come on, man. Like, that. my dad used to ref with you guys. Like, come on. Like, yeah, man. That's oh, what I, I, like, I, I'm like, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know that you guys went back to it. Hey, I don't. I don't know. I, when when, when I met you, Chris, when I met the to you, all you said was Dane. I'm putting put that out there. All you said was Dane. I, I hey. did, but I didn't want to go. I didn't honestly. I didn't, I didn't, didn't want to go too much into it because I'm like, you know, I'll wait and see if he actually realized who it is. <laughs> yeah, okay. yo, I, I I actually literally saw you in a picture on Instagram the other day. Oh my god, that's okay. Chris. <laughs> like, you, you weren't tagged in it. Like, you were at some ball tournament quote, or I think you were handing out medals or something like that. Yeah, I was handing the medals. I was like, that's Chris. Like, what the hell? And no, I'm like, but you weren't tagged in it or nothing. I was like, I haven't seen Chris in a minute. How's your pops anyways, anyways, on a side note? He's good, man. He's good. He's doing his comedy. Like, he's trying to, he, we're trying to do, bit. him and I are actually looking at doing some collab stuff together, which will be we really We need to talk. No, I'm, I'm going to, real story, it's because your, it's because your father that got me into, got me into it, eh? Really? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little story. So I was coaching before. This is a little quick side note. I was coaching before doing other stuff, and your dad was about to do his tour. And he's like, yo, you know, and I, I was doing comedy shows. I was hosting comedy shows, so your dad and we were working together. And he's like, he's about to go on his tour across Canada. And he's like, you know, I'm about to go on this tour. Can you come on and help me assist and coach this team? Or Garth? I'm like, oh, you know what? I ain't doing nothing. I'll get I'll, I'll, fine. I'll do it. So I started doing that, and then Garth was like, yo, you need to start coaching. <laughs> And that was it. And I'm like, yo, I'm sorry, man. I'm going to start taking this team. He's like, are you serious? You're supposed to help me out. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and then like 22 years later, look where we are. <laughs> that's actually crazy. Yeah. You know that's so funny. That's so funny because I did. I just did that for one of my boys in Edmonton. Like he started helping me out. And it's just like, I got so busy. And then he's just like, nah, that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm taking, I'm, I'm doing this. And I'm like, 
Bro. Yeah, your dad, your dad's responsible for my, your dad's responsible for my influence on basketball. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually, I did not know that. <laughs> and I'm not editing, editing this part out. I am keeping this part. I'm keeping this, this genuine genuinity. What the fuck? What's wrong with me? But I'm keeping this genuine part of the show in it. <laughs> I like that word actually. I might, I might brand that genuine. <laughs> <laughs> genuinity. <laughs> it's a good. Hey, I need, I need some copyright for that. It's a copyright. <laughs> <laughs> you take, take the residuals. Let's take the residuals. I'll, I'll, ta- I'll take. I'll take. I'll take the seven oh four. I'll take the seven oh five north, and you, you can take that word. Oh shoot! They they stole that from me. I damn. I got done dirty on that one, but that's a whole other. Story. Oh man! Don't worry. No, we're we're about to touch on that a little bit. We're about to touch on that a little bit. I I, I read up on that as well, so we will touch up on that. But uh, quick question for you, though, touch on you know, seeing how the game has evolved and changed. Would you prefer to play in this generation, or are you happy you play in the era that you did? Happy playing the era that I did. Like, the game now. I, I mean, like, I love ball. I always will. But, you know, when the old heads talk about back in the day, I feel like I'm <laughs> turning into one of those, to be honest. Like, back in the day? This is how we played it. Like, the game has become a little, it's kind of a little soft. And it, mm-hmm. each generation, I think it comes a little softer. Everybody's shooting jump shots and dribbling now and throwing their head back. And it wasn't like that back in the day. And I missed that game. You know, that grinder game. You can't, like, yeah. if you're easy, you're going to grind and go hard to the back. Like, it's just not, the game is not conducive to that anymore. Like, they, you got to, you got to be smooth. Hand, and it's more skilled. Which is way great, more skilled. Which yep. is great. Like, it's a way more skilled game. But, like, I miss that grinder game. Like, I love yep. that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're, 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 you're right about that. I, I call it the COVID variants. They get softer and softer every year. Every year. Uh, <laughs> um, you went to Laurentian for five years, but played for four. Why did you choose Laurentian? I chose Laurentian uh, at the time because I just thought it was the best fit for me. It was a bilingual school. They were offering me um, a good scholarship, and I just vibed with Coach Sean. Like, Sean was just a young guy, player's coach. I just thought it was a good chance to try to, you know, rebuild. They were rebuilding, and I'm like, you know what? I want to be part of something that's going to grow. I want to start – I want to be a part of something that's grassroots and growing from the bottom. So – that's that's the mentality I had. What was the one thing that Coach Sean taught you, and that you you can you can hold on for the rest of your life? It's up to you. <laughs> ah, I feel like that's a that's a Sean thing. Sean will do anything for you if you want to, but if you don't want to, he's not doing nothing for you. And that's really it with Sean. Like Sean will come to the gym at midnight to come shoot with you if you want to go shoot. But if you don't mm-hmm. want to shoot, he's not asking you to shoot. You gotta ask him because. You're the <laughs> And it's really up to you, and that's that's one big lesson from Sean. <laughs> oh, Sean, for that one. Hopefully, the kid, the kids of, of today will understand that that quote because honestly, that's a big quote for these kids in this, this generation. They're lazy as hell. So hopefully, they'll they'll start getting a little bit more and understanding. It's up to you if you want to go to the NBA. It's up to you if you want to get a Division One scholarship. It's up to you if you want to go play CIS or U Sport or whatever it's called nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, while you were, while you were at Laurentian, you started a clothing line to represent the Laurentian Athletics. How did that come about? And, you know, you know, you mentioned a second ago that it, it, they did you dirty. Do you mind going into a little bit of detail about that? Yeah, I'll brief. I won't, I, won't, I won't bash the school too much. But, you know, I, became, I, I came up with the – I actually – I originally came up with the Laurentian State. That was the, the first brand I came up with with the, with the school. Like, I made teachers at Laurentian State because the joke – the running joke when we were there was, we're all grinding so hard, we all want to make it. It's like a juco. So, we're like, yo, Laurentian State. <laughs> So I made some t-shirts on Laurentian State. We're like, oh, that's hard. So we started making t-shirts and Laurentian State was a thing. And then Sean looked at it and Sean was like, I don't like this. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we're not, we're not in the States. Like, it doesn't make any sense. He goes, yo, if you make a brand, if you make something that's good, I'll, I'll, I'll make it for the team. But he goes, I don't like this. So I sat there and I was thinking about it. And I was like, what can we make um, that would be that Sean would like? And I thought about it. And I'm like, you know what? When we're from Laurentian, Laurentian is one of those places not everybody, people confuse it with Laurier, people confuse it with this, they confuse it with that, and in Quebec. And there's all kinds of questions about Laurentian, is, and I realized we had an identity crisis. And what would help us identify ourselves? We're from the 705. So I'm like, we're from the North 705. And that's kind of how it came to life. And then the O was our, was our logo. So it was like I used our own logo to design the actual brand, and it was fire. Sean made them, the fans loved it, it was marketable. And one day the school came in and they're just like, yo, you're using our logo. We don't like you. Stop it. And then that was really it for me in terms of like making money, making a business out of it. But Sean continued to make them and the team still wears them to this day. But the business aspect of it kind of just died because the school stepped in and 
and, and kind of and kind of ruin that for me. All right. And I thought we could have partnered. I thought we could have done more with it. But I mean, it's their logo. It's their choice. Like, what am I supposed to say? Yeah. However, it's still something that exists to this day. And it was really about us being proud of where we're from and identifying ourselves. That's tough. So you, you anytime you go back to the Laurentian game, you're like, you guys know where those shirts came from? Came from me, man. Came from me. Better put some respect on my name. <laughs> uh, you transferred to McGill for one year, one more year of basketball, I think. Was it one more year? Yeah, so you I graduated from Laurentian and did my master's at McGill. Why did you choose McGill and not another school you could have won a championship on, like Carlton or, or, or Ryerson? What's funny is, like, I, I did get into Ryerson, and I did commit to Ryerson originally. Mm. Went on to McGill. And then Sean actually recommended me going to Carlton. And for me, at that point, I was really not about – my, my priorities changed from basketball to school. And at that point, I'm like, I want to go to the best school and get the best education so I can go into my field. And McGill was the best school, uh, in my opinion, for that. And when I committed to Ryerson, I was on the wait list at McGill. And I was about to go to Ryerson. And Ryerson had a great program. They were branded very well. And it was me coming home. So I was, I was partially excited about that. But then when McGill hit me up and they're like, listen, like, you're in. I was like, no, I got to go to Montreal. My grandparents are there. My grandparents got me see, see me play ball. Um, and McGill was still a good basketball program. We still won the we still won a provincial championship. We still went to nationals rank fourth. We beat Ottawa U that year. Like, we should have been ranked number one at one point during that season. So it was like we were a top five team in the country as well. So it, was like it wasn't really a – I can't say it was a bad decision because I, I still had an amazing time. I still was an all-star. Like, I still really had a good – I had a really good year. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, at Nationals, things just didn't work out. And Carlton always comes away with, with, with it somehow or another. Carlton, or Ry well, I mean, Ryerson won one of them, but it's typically Carlton at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to ask you this, this because I, I don't know. Who was McGill's rival and what were those games like? Mm. McGill's rival that season probably would have been – well, we never have a natural rivalry with Concordia uh, just mm -hmm. because we're both English-speaking schools in Montreal. Um, but that, that wasn't the one for us. The one for us was Laval, like Laval University mm -hmm. of Laval. They, they that the, that year, it's like they had our number, and they had these two guys. I can't one. I think it was Le, Leclerc. This guy Alexander Leclerc <laughs> and this guy Tate. And these two guards were disgusting. And they handled. They could shoot it. And they just when they played us, they would just turn it on. And like they beat us twice that year. We played. We beat them twice. And when we got to our, our tournament, our conference tournament, we played them first round. And we were like, all game, we're like, ah, oh, God. And we're playing them at home too. And they were <laughs> hanging out us in the third quarter. And it was like one of those games where it's like, yo, we can lose this game. And I remember like, I don't know, I hit a big shot down the stretch, dished it off for a big layup down the stretch. It went from 10 to five and the momentum just started and the crowd had us. We ended up winning that game. But that game was the game that scared the hell out of me. I'm like, if we lose this, this is a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. And we ended up pulling it out. And that's, and yeah, we beat UCAM in the finals and we went to Nationals. It was good. Well, shout out that game. I wish I was there for that one. If there's any, if there's any film on that one, you got to send it to me. You got to send it me that film for sure. Like, you got to see that. That was <laughs> exciting, man. That game sounds that game sound really exciting. It was good, man. It was really good. Any regrets during your basketball career? I regret not going harder um, mm -hmm. on everything. You know what I mean? Like, when I look back at it, I don't think I was as focused as I should have been. You know, like, knowing the work it takes um, to get to the next level, I don't think I was putting in that work. And I say that even from high school, right? Was I putting up, you know, I, I think it's like learning about goal setting, right? And I, I don't think I understood it. Like, you know, if I want to be good, I got to be making 500 shots per day. I, I didn't think like that at high school. And it's like, I didn't start thinking that till later in my university career. And I think if I had thought that way earlier on, I would have been a lot um, better of a player. Like, I didn't, I didn't really try to develop my guard skills as much as I could have. I didn't really put in the work that I needed to put in in order to get somewhere. And now that I, now that I know what it takes to get there, I would, have, I would have gone so much harder. I know you mentioned going harder and, 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 and things like that, but what is something that you at – 29, you're turning 30 this year. You have to same age as me. Happy belated birthday. Happy belated birthday. I'm about to turn 30 in, in less than a, a, a month today, actually. A month today, I'll be 30. So I'll be joining with you 
in in in, in a month. Um, but you know, thirty year old Tyshawn, what's something that you would tell sixteen year old Tyshawn? I would say, um, find what you love and go hard at it, right? And I think all of us we're taught we talk about it. Oh, I don't know what I like. I don't know what I want to do. I don't. We all know something we like. And we all know that, you know, there could be a way of making money in it. There could, there could not be, but there's something, if we love something, I think we need to go hard for that thing. And on that journey, you find out ways of making money. You find out what you make connection. You find your network. You, when you go hard in doing something, other doors open for you. And I think I would tell my, my 18 year old self that, right. I was very much like, I don't know. I don't know. And then you just don't, you don't do anything hard. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't go through life and through like that. You can't even play basketball like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, You're right. can, you know what I mean? Like if you if you can shoot the ball, shoot the ball, do it well, <laughs> keep practicing it, other opportunities will come for you. Yeah. And I think it's 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 like that for me in life. Like I I would tell myself, go hard at whatever it is you like or enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rest will follow, the rest will make sense. I love that one because even for me, my dad used to always tell me, I don't want you waking up one day and, and looking at looking at the mirror and say, damn, damn, I wish I could have, or damn, I, I wish I did, or whatever case was. And I'm 16, 15, 17, 18, whatever. And I'm like, dad, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm going hard. I'm doing what I need to do. I'm working out all the time. Da, 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 da. And looking back at it now that I'm about to be 30, she, like you said earlier, man, I did not go as hard as I thought I did. I I, I worked hard, which we all know. I was always sweating and stuff, but nah, man, I didn't, I didn't work as hard as I thought I should have or could have. Um, I should have been. I should have been in the gym putting up more shots. I should have been in the gym working on my handle more. I should have been working on my lateral quickness a lot more. But man, I love that answer for real. Yeah, uh, like, quicker. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. My fault. My fault. Go ahead. Yeah, like you're completely right. That's how I feel. Right. Yeah, Lastly, I got a quick hitter to end up the show. Look at this guy taking pictures and shit of, of, of I was himself. Fired, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was taking pictures of the of the of the convo. Like I thought it was kind of you know. <laughs> uh last last one or quick hit to end up the show uh favorite song before a game favorite song before a game that's a tough one because it's like back then it would have to be some kind it would be some meek mill <laughs> have to be some kind of meek yep. mill track like yep. back then i'm a, I'm a ball like it'd be like <laughs> it's something where meek mill screaming <laughs> You know, dreams and nightmares. Dreams, like it have to be something with Meat Mill yelling. Before dreams and nightmares number two, the best yeah. one by the most the most amplified songs of to get to get ready for a game. One hundred percent. I'm a boss. Uh, house party. House party. Uh, I can't even think, think of all of them right now. But those ones. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it has to be. It has to be a Meat Mill something. Yep. Yep. For the game like that, that that gets you in the zone. Like you're going hard. For sure. Here, uh, most influential quote <coughs> that you live. Quote, quote. That's what you want to say, Chris. Quote. Oh my God! You know what? It's called quote. Quote. No. Most influential quote. So you better, because you know I don't stumble too much. It's always Stephen stumbling. All right. So when I stumble, it's a problem. Lord have mercy. You see how this always works over here? Oh, like I said, most influential quote that you live. Talk to. Me. Uh, success is on the other side of your fear. Ooh, good one. Shit. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. Quick. That was that's quick. quick. He, he lives that. That you tell he lives that one. <laughs> that that one lives. Me, and that's one I have to remind myself of all the time. You know, there's there's other quotes I definitely live by. Um, but success is on the other side of your fear is one that really um because I, I always say like one of the ones I live by is like the wisest mind has something yet to learn. And that's really about being a lifelong learner. But the success is on the other side of your fear. We remind you because fear is something we feel very frequently. And when, when we're trying new things or we're and we're navigating life and you have to remind yourself that the fear is your growth. And, yep. and feeling that mean that discomfort is actually you growing. And when you remind yourself that your success is on the other side of that discomfort, it, it helps you push to keep going. Sure, sure. I love like that. that. I love that. Um, if you could have a one-hour conversation with anybody in the world, dead or alive, who would it be? Barack Obama. Wow, you you thought about these ones. Really thought about <laughs> it. Yeah, it'd be Barack. You know, like that guy. Like to me, is one of the most inspirational, influential, um, well-spoken people I've ever seen. 
So it'd probably be him. Okay. If you could rewrite a part of history, um, which piece would you want to be a part of? Uh, anything that to do with war and violence in this world, I would want to rewrite, to be honest, because like, it's unnecessary. There's an abundance <laughs> of so many things. You know, so much, I, I don't know what we're even fighting over half the time. You know what I mean? Like, we're all, as a human race, we're all we're all just people. We're all the same. Why are we always fighting? There's nothing to fight over. It'd be that. I like that one. I like that. I I, I know I know. Chris had another question for you, another quick hitter for you as well. Um, you you want to ask it, Chris? Mm, which other quick hitter? I got a lot of stuff I want to ask this guy. <laughs> <laughs> His initiatives. Oh, you know what? You know what? Actually, when you want to get into it, thank you very much, Steven. See? That's why you work so well together, Steven. What other things are you doing? Oh, my gosh. I tell you, put the mirror down and talk to me straight. So, like I said, <laughs> so what other things are you doing in the Black, like, you know, for, you know, I'm, I'm a very big on, I'm doing things for Black History Month. It just finished right now. What would you do? do, you get into, do you, is there anything you get involved in, you support, um, active in, like anything around that? Because I know it was the last month, it was, it was really good to be able to do a lot of things for Black History Month. What's, what's your participation in that? I don't think my any initiative I, I participate in is, is ever specific to that month. Um, I, I don't like to just do something for that month and then not do something for the rest of the year because it, it gives me an authentic vibe, ingenuity. It's not <laughs> <laughs> lack of genuinity in that, to be honest with you. Uh, no, but for real, like uh, the initiatives, like so, for example, I teach at Aspire for Hire, actually, I teach an anti black. Um, racism course around mental health for Black Canadians. And it's oh, really? really? Uh, yeah. So I teach that weekly on Tuesdays. Um, that's a really big initiative for me because it's like I'm learn when you're when you're teaching, you're also learning. So I'm yep. learning a lot um, from the students from the from the course material and really talking about different things around you know mental health, mental health awareness, communication techniques, um, self awareness, personal development, all the things related to to mental health and teaching them to you. I think is really impactful and it's not just a black history month thing for me it's like i've been doing this for the last couple of months um so that's one of the big initiatives that i'm involved in um and then another one that i just do on my own social media is mental health monday every monday i talk about mental health in some way shape or form whether it's a story whether it's a quote whether it's something i'm going through i even want to get funny ones going now where it's like you know we don't have to talk about it in this mm, mental health. i want to make it like we could joke about certain things because it's like as long as we're having the conversation, I'm I'm with it, right? So those are I think are two big initiatives for me teaching that course, and then um, the mental health Monday, and then speaking. Like I go to now I start I'm going to schools and speaking, right? Talking about overcoming adversity and living in truth, talking about anti-black racism, talking about toxic masculinity, um, talking about I even have a talk this weekend that talks about urban planning and, de and designing more inclusive spaces and places and buildings and communities so it's like all these kind of things are initiatives that i participate in to give back and to really talk about the importance of inclusion I like that it's really, like really the mess the overarching message is let's include I, everybody i think we i think we're gonna be talking a bit more you're gonna be seeing him more and now you're talking you're right down my alley on a lot of these things that you're talking about so we will definitely have more conversations about that i love what you're doing out there it's really really big we need that. We need more. We need more guys like you doing that type of stuff. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. It's like, yeah, that's that's the lane I'm going down right now. So if you have any opportunities, you want to work together on something, you let me know because I'm I'm always down to work on these kind of things, right? Beautiful, beautiful. He's he's always in go mode, Chris. Fred is yeah, right there, go mode. <laughs> <laughs> that's for my that's for my men, my my men's league. <laughs> I'll say he, he's always in go mode. He's always in go mode. Uh, last quick hitter we have for you here, Tyshawn, is uh, who do you want to see on Talk Your Exposure? But but the kicker is you got to help us with your answer. I don't know what happened to my screen. Who would I want to see on Talk Your Exposure? Barack Obama. <laughs> oh, you know you have his number. <laughs> you have his number? You're connected to Barack Obama like that? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Let me, like, who would I want to see on here besides me? Uh, that's crazy. Um... It had to be someone from the, uh, someone from the city who I find really influential. 
I gotta give that's that's probably the toughest question you guys have asked me. <laughs> you know, like I, I gotta, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you look stumped. <laughs> I, mean, I, that one. I actually don't know. It's don't fun, know. it's fun. It, it's funny because I was actually trying to get a uh, um, a forum table around. I was trying to get you, Dougie, and Ched. But obviously, you know, Chad's Hollywood and doesn't respond to anybody. I don't know him from anywhere. I want to get you on. You're Hollywood, too. And Dougie actually responded back. He's like, if you get the both of them on, then I'll come on, too. And I'm like, you know what? That would be a good one to have because I really feel like, you know, between the three of you guys, you guys could bounce off, off each other comedy-wise. You guys could bounce off each other, you know, just, just influential-wise. You guys have a lot of similarities. So I feel like that would, that would have been a good one. So, um, but no, definitely, you know, let me know who, you, who you're thinking because I know you know a lot of people, man. I know you know a lot of people. And there's, there's someone in particular, I'll tell you off after the show afterwards, you know, that I, would, I wouldn't mind if you could help us connect with. But um, again, you know, Tyshawn, what, what, one last thing I want to say to you and, and ask you is, where can we find you on social media? Where can our people find you on social media? To Sean Carter Newman on YouTube. Uh, big one for me, you know, subscribe. Turn on those notifications, like and comment. Uh, and then to Sean X Carter at Instagram, to Sean Carter on TikTok. Like anything to Sean, you're going to find me. Type in, no one spells to Sean like to Sean. I just gave you a follow on the Talk Your Exposure page. You have 22,000 followers. Good for you, my guy. Good for you. 22,000 yeah. followers. You're, you're, you're definitely influential and, 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 and famous. Uh, but again, Tyshawn, we want to thank you again for your time, man. You know, we, 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 we really appreciate this. It was fun going down memory lane with you and just kind of re reliving yeah. a lot of your history and whatnot. Uh, obviously, for me in particular, I, I'm sure Chris could talk for himself afterwards, but for me in particular, it's good to be able to hit you up and talk to you again. It's been a long time since we've had, we've had a conversation, but like I said earlier, man, we've known each other from for a long time now, man, from, from Etobicoke Thunder versus Bounce Days, from Bounce Days, from BJC versus Marauders, I want to say. Man, we play against each other a lot, man. So definitely would appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming back on the show or coming on the show. And hopefully one day we'll be able to get you back on here again and, and uh, you know, talk about other different initiatives that we're trying to start as well, whether it's AU or or training or basketball or, or anything in general. So uh, definitely appreciate the time you gave us today, man. Of course, brother, man. I appreciate you for having me. And, you know, if there's any initiatives on that you think we're aligned with, don't be afraid to hit me up to collab. You just got to email me, man. <laughs> <laughs> now i know that but i also want to shout out saying you know what it's kind of cool because you know i've seen you i've seen you grow <laughs> i literally That's seen true. you grow so you know seeing what you know how i met you um through your father and on seeing how much you grow as a young man and all the things you've accomplished it's really really big and i know this is nothing like i know your type like i know your atmosphere i know your energy so this is like you know a, a, a scratch of the surface of really seeing what you're about. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Looking forward to seeing you a little bit long, you know, a little later, a little later, little, little later down the line. And, uh, you know, that Hollywood look is definitely a look for you. You know, Steve is not just saying he's, 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 calling, he's calling to existence because, you know, Steve <laughs> wants to make sure that he got the plug and he's the first to say it, right? So when you are that status, you'd be like, yeah, I said it first. But, you know, but honestly, the, the limelight is good for you. It's also good that you, you're just giving back so much. And we need that. We need that. A lot of these young people do need that. So we appreciate you doing all those things you're doing. All right? appreciate you saying that, man. Again, I appreciate you guys having me, man. And it's like, we all go way back. We all come from the same place. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we always got to remember to give back to the place we came from. True. Again, th this is episode number 50, halfway to 100. You, you guys can check us out on YouTube under RWI Basketball or on Spotify, Google, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, wherever you guys get your podcast from under Talk Your Exposure. This episode with Tyshawn Carter-Newman, and we're excited to be able to drop it and release it to all of you guys tuning in and paying attention.